Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at Greek mythology and exploring whether or not an immortal life can be snuffed out, whether or not you can really kill a god, whether or not Kratos would have actually been able to rampage up the slopes of Olympus and destroy every divine being who crossed his path. We're going to start things off by taking a look at a couple of monster myths and then we'll go through a miscellaneous assortment of injuries and predicaments that several immortal beings have to contend with, finishing with those that were most life-threatening or perhaps even life-ending. The first story we're going to look at is that of Medusa. The reason she's targeted rather than either of her two sisters is because of the Gorgon trio, Medusa is the only one who's mortal meaning in the context of the story that she's the only one who can actually be killed. It would have been futile for Perseus to attempt to slay either of Medusa's sisters, for being immortal makes them impervious to death. I feel like it's quite fair to extrapolate from this story and apply the nature of immortality that's conveyed in Perseus's own quest to every immortal who exists in Greek mythology. Another monster-centric story that really highlights the deathlessness of immortals is Hercules' second labor, which was to slay the Lernian Hydra. The strategy employed by Hercules in slaying this monster was to destroy the heads and cauterize the stumps. However, this strategy could only take him so far because one of the heads was immortal. This final head couldn't be killed, so Hercules had to bury it under a boulder after he cut it off. While I believe these two stories combine to make an incredibly persuasive argument in favor of immortals not being able to be killed, sorry Kratos, neither story features deities nor deities fighting deities. Let's now take a look at the grievous injuries and the dire predicaments that harrow many deities in Greek mythology, beginning with those featured throughout the Greek creation myth. Uranus is the first deity to suffer a serious injury. Cronus, Uranus' youngest son, ambushes his father and castrates him, tossing the pair of severed testicles into the sea. This act represented the supersession of the primordial deities by the Titans. Though seriously injured, Uranus' emasculation resulted in the separation of Gaia and Uranus, which was the extrication of Earth from Sky, but did not result in his death. The next trauma suffered was by the first generation of Olympians. Cronus learned of a prophecy that foretold his downfall at the hands of one of his children, so he consumed each child as soon as they were born, swallowing them. However, this was an imprisonment, not a death sentence, for later, Zeus forced Cronus to disgorge his siblings, and out they came, fully grown and unharmed. After this, there was the Titanomachy, which was the cataclysmic war fought between the Olympians and the Titans. Though the war raged for ten long years, with the Olympians emerging as the victors, there weren't any casualties suffered by either side. Yes, many titans were cast down into the depths of Tartarus, and yes, Atlas was condemned to an eternity of holding up the sky on his shoulders, but there was no god or titan who actually died. Following this comes the calamitous head-to-head -head between Zeus and the monster Typhon. Early accounts have Zeus soundly defeating Typhon and then imprisoning him in Tartarus. In later, more elaborate accounts, Typhon initially overpowers Zeus, incapacitating him by cutting the sinews from his hands and feet and then keeping Zeus in his cave. For whatever reason, Typhon elects not to capitalize on this advantage, maybe because Zeus is unkillable, and Zeus, with the aid of others, has his sinews restored, bestowing him with the opportunity of a second bout in which he does defeat Typhon, burying the monster under a mountain. The next event was the Gigantomachy, but we're going to table it for the time being and circle back to it at the end, now transitioning into the miscellaneous injury and predicament segment of the video. Prometheus, whose name meant forethought, sided with the Olympians during the Titanomachy, thereby avoiding imprisonment in Tartarus. He was the people's champion, but he swindled the king of the gods too many times. 
First, he tricked Zeus into choosing the bones, leaving the meat and the fat for humanity. And then he stole fire from Zeus and gave it back to mankind. His punishment after this second transgression was to be chained to a rock for eternity and have a giant bird eat his liver each day. For each night, Prometheus's liver would regenerate. Metis, an oceanid, found herself in a predicament similar to the one of the first generation of Olympians when they were devoured by Cronus. It was prophesied that Metis would birth a son with the power to overthrow his father, Zeus. To prevent this, Zeus tricked Metis into transforming into a fly and then swallowing her in that form. And this leads us to our next entry. Zeus was only partially successful when he consumed Metis. She was already pregnant with a daughter, which in turn impregnated Zeus. Later, an excruciating headache racked Zeus, so he asked Hephaestus for help. The smith god obliged by splitting Zeus's head with an axe, and out came Athena, fully grown and adorned in armor. Ares, the god of war, was abducted by a set of giant twin brothers, Otus and Ephialtes. They kept him chained in a bronze cauldron for 13 months, and according to Homer, being imprisoned in such a sorry state, so long deprived of food and drink, nearly claimed the god's life. Had it not been for the twin stepmother bringing the matter to Hermes' attention, Ares very well could have died. But as we'll see, death for a god isn't always what it seems. Dionysus, the god of wine, was the son of Zeus and the princess Semele. Hera infected Semele's mind with doubt during her pregnancy, manipulating her into demanding that Zeus show her his true form to prove that he was really divine. Semele asked him for a favor, to which Zeus replied that he would grant her anything her heart desired. Now compelled by oath, Zeus was forced to comply with Semele's request. He revealed his true form, but of course, it was far too much for Semele's mortal form. Zeus appeared before her as the Lord of Storms and the wielder of lightning. Semele was consumed by fire and destroyed. The unborn fetus gestating inside her, Dionysus, survived the ordeal, and Zeus took him and sewed him into his own thigh. Another version of Dionysus' birth begins with the god Zagreus, who was the son of Zeus and Persephone, who became impregnated after Zeus took the form of a serpent and seduced her. Of course, Hera learned of this, yet another instance of infidelity perpetrated by her lecherous husband. She incited the Titans and turned them on Zagreus. They came upon Zagreus while he was just an infant and hacked him into pieces, but Zeus managed to salvage the heart. He used it to brew a potion which he made Semele drink, impregnating her. She later birthed the god Dionysus, effectively reincarnating Zagreus. Before we move on to our last entry, let's do a quick recap of everything that's been survived so far. Having your testicles cut off, being swallowed and then thrown up, an earth-shaking war between two factions of deities, a duel to the death against the most fearsome monster imaginable, having your liver eaten each night for thousands of years, being tricked into transforming into a fly and then being swallowed, having your head split open by an axe and then giving birth out of your skull, being locked in a bronze cauldron for 13 months, being a fetus on the ground amidst the ashes of your incinerated mother, and being hacked to pieces and then resurrected. I think it's safe to say that, at the very least, the Greek perception of immortals was extremely resilient. According to the Greek historian Plutarch, who lived between 46 AD and 119 AD, in his work De Defectu Oraculorum, Pan enters previously uncharted territory by being the only known example of a deity dying. Here's the passage. Thamus, are you there? When you reach Pallades, take care to proclaim that the great god Pan is dead. Because there is absolutely no information given about the details of Pan's death, most experts don't believe this was the case. Here are a couple of theories I've come across. One is that it was symbolic of Christianity usurping the position that pagan religions previously enjoyed. 
The other is that it was a result of poor translation. This last example involving Pan certainly muddies the waters, but given that no information was given, it was just someone quickly shouting at someone else, I'm inclined to believe that it was either supposed to be symbolic of the passing of the torch from polytheism to monotheism, or that something was misunderstood. Of all of the above examples, what I find to be most telling is the fact that no divine beings Olympian or Titan, perished during the great war that was fought. If immortals truly were able to be killed, one of them surely would have been slain in that conflict. Furthermore, after Zeus defeated Typhon, there was another war, the Gigantomachy, in which, again, no divine beings were destroyed. The giants were a race spawned from the droplets of blood that fell and saturated the earth after Uranus's testicles were severed from his loins. Though they weren't immortal, the giants were extremely powerful and were not to be trifled with. They fought furiously, but in the end, couldn't withstand the combined might of the gods. My belief is that if immortal beings could be killed in Greek mythology, at least one of them would have died during either the Titanomachy or the Gigantomachy, or by the hands of the monstrous Typhon. To have one declared dead by some offhand remark, makes no sense and is completely incongruous with everything else that happens. And that's it for this video. What do you guys think? Do you know of any incidents in which gods have died? Comment down below.